I'm going to, uh, I'm going to come back to uh, personal recollection because I think that was a very appropriate and moving way to start the meeting and there is something to be said um, about that, I think, um, in relation to what our rulers are doing. But let me say first of all, um, just a little bit about the argument that is going on. Our rulers are taking this argument about the nature of the First World War surprisingly seriously, in a way, because it, you know it's a, it's a debate about events which happened 100 years ago. Kicked off this year by uh, Gove, and who is really my sort of, you know, he, he's the Tory that one loves to hate. I mean, the word odious comes to mind every time that face appears um, on the screen. Gove kicks it off, talking about how we should be using this, this year and this centenary to celebrate the British victory and to honour those who did their duty, who fought for uh, king and country and so on. And there is, they have a programme which is linked with that idea, which is a series of commemorative paving stones, which they're planning to unveil in communities across Britain, to mark the birthplaces of all of those who won a VC in the First World War. So the, the intention is to reconfigure the way in which we think about the First World War and to make it a story about heroes and military glory and not a story which it has traditionally been of slaughter on an absolutely massive scale. And it's, you know, our war memorials and our war cemeteries are intentionally egalitarian, democratic. Everybody is treated in the same way and celebrated in the same way. They want to reconfigure the way in which we think about the First World War and turn it into a story about heroism and glory. That's reflected not just at government level, but also by a cohort of right-wing, revisionist, military historians who are pushing hard an argument, which was essentially the argument of Britain's rulers in 1914, that it was Germany's fault, Germany was an expansionist power, Germany was an aggressive power, Germany was exceptionally militaristic, and therefore Britain was right to go to war, the Allied powers collectively were right uh, to oppose Germany. The, the, the Max, Max Hastings is leading the pack. I mean, he's just had a, an hour's uh, television, courtesy of the BBC, following several hours of broadcasting by Paxman, who was putting essentially the same argument. And then, laughingly, the debate, in so far, so far as the BBC is concerned, is putting up Niall Ferguson, a hardline neocon supporter of imperialism, an advocate of imperialist war, supposedly to create a debate. <laughs> now, this is not a debate. There isn't, you don't have a debate between a right-wing historian like Max Hastings and a right-wing historian <laughs> like uh, Niall uh, Ferguson. Why are they doing this? What, why, is, why so much effort being put into this argument? It is because, I want to suggest, Syria and Ukraine are relevant yeah, right yeah. now to what yeah, this yeah. argument is about. Last summer, they lost the vote in the House of Commons to launch another imperialist war, to launch an attack on Syria. That was an absolutely, that, that represented a, um, a shifting of tectonic plates in terms of Western imperialism. It was the great victory represented by 12 years of campaigning, yeah, yeah. by the Stop the War Coalition and anti-war activists in a general sense. That was the moment when the war on terror unraveled and you had a reaction that was <coughs> even reflected in the House of Commons, and it's worth stressing that. We have known where public opinion has been on these wars for a very, very long time. We saw the public response when they started it in 2003, even the House of Commons now reflects that anti-war opinion which, which, which is built up. That is a major problem for them. They have a major problem projecting military power in the interests of Western corporations, Western profit, Western power, because of what has happened over the last 12 years. They're trying to rehabilitate the idea that Britain and the Western powers more generally, when they intervene, in other parts of the world, do so in the interests of democracy and equality and progress and civilization and so on. That's why they want to talk about the First World War. And then there is Ukraine. And you can see the tension 
in the world, can't you, around the crisis in Ukraine, which has become a competition between Russian imperialism on one side and Western imperialism on the other yeah, yeah. to determine whether the Ukrainian economy will look to the east or look to the west. And you can see, you can, you can feel the tension in the air and the possibility of it turning into a violent uh, conflict. They want to be able to project military power when they need to in crises of that kind when they come up. That's why the argument about the First World War matters. That's why they're putting so much effort into it. They want to re-establish the idea that when Britain goes to war, and when Western countries go to war, it is in the interest of enlightenment and civilization and democracy and so on. Now, I want to suggest that we need to think about the First World War in a very different way <coughs> from the way in which they are framing the debate. Though I am going to talk about the specific arguments that, uh, that they are putting, but I want to reframe the debate. And I want to do it in this way. I want to say to you that there are two ways of looking at history. There are always two ways of looking at history. And that's because we live in a class society. And therefore you can look at it from above, or you can look at it from below. I want, I want to look at it from above for a moment. And this is what you see in 1914, if you look at it from above. In one place, you see a group of bankers and industrialists and generals gathered around a German cross. And then you pan across Europe and you see another group of bankers and industrialists and generals gathered around a French tricolor. And you pan across again and you see another bunch of the same sort of people gathered around a Union Jack. They are divided. They are divided because they are competing for wealth, competing for markets, competing for places in the world to which they can send their capital, competing for control <coughs> over resources, over raw materials, over markets which will enable them to make themselves even richer than they already are. They are competing with each other for empire and profit. And they had gobbled up by the time of the First World War much of the rest of the world, turning it either into colonies that were directly controlled by uh, Europeans or into spheres of influence which were tied in to their own uh, economies. They chopped up most of the world in that sense and then the conflict rebounded back into Europe and created rising tension inside uh, Europe. Remember we're still looking at history from above right now. So when I talk about the British, I mean the British ruling class, the bankers and the industrialists and so on. I'm talking about that level of society. Look at it from the point of view of the British and uh, they already control, do you know how much? A fifth of the world's land mass and a quarter of the world's population. That was the size of the British Empire in 1914. They need control of the sea because of that. So they engage in a naval arms race with Germany, invest huge resources in keeping their naval lead and win the naval arms race. And then they sit back and they say, our hands are clean. We believe in peace. We favor the security um, of Europe. We are not warmongers. If you had lived under British rule in Ireland, or Egypt, or South Africa, or India, you would have had no doubt that Britain was an imperial power, a militarist power, a heavily armed power, a repressive power. But in relation to Europe, they present themselves as peacemongers. <coughs> Germany, on the other hand, is a central European power that industrialises relatively late. And that budgeting German economy 
is seeking markets and seeking raw materials and seeking investment <coughs> opportunities in a world which has already been to a very large extent carved up by the established imperial powers. So is it true that Germany is aggressive, is expansionist? Yes. It's also true that the British are aggressive and expansionist. It's also true that the French are aggressive and expansionist. It's also true uh, specifically uh, in relation to uh, the Germans that they see themselves as being surrounded. If you, if you put in front of the TV cameras the German equivalent of Max Hastings, <coughs> what he would be saying, or she, is that Germany is being surrounded. There's Russia on one side in alliance with France, and France is also, uh, France and Russia are also in alliance with Britain. We've lost the naval arms race, the Russian army is getting bigger, the French army is getting bigger. We need to fight now, or we're going to lose. In five years, in ten years, there's war coming, we're better off fighting now. That's the perspective of German statesmen. Now, that's one view of the world. That's the view from above. These competing groups of bankers and industrialists and generals. And what I want to suggest to you is that that is a profoundly dysfunctional world. A world divided into competing corporations, competing banks, competing nation states, competing empires. A profoundly dysfunctional world. Yeah, yeah. And there's another way of looking at the world. And that's to view it from below. It looks very different. Very, very different. If you are a striking miner in South Wales in 1914, I'll tell you who the enemy is. The enemy is the mine boss. The enemy is not a German miner who might also be on strike against the mine boss in the Ruhr, or a Czech miner on strike against the mine boss in Bohemia, or a Russian miner on strike against the mine boss in the Donbass. The enemy is at home. The enemy is your own ruling class. The enemy is your own boss. And the enemy is the state that defends the wealth and the power of the bosses. How does it look if you are fighting for the right to vote. <coughs> One of the things they say about Germany is it, wasn't, it was autocratic. Britain was more autocratic, let me tell you. 40% of men didn't have the vote in Britain in 1914. That's half the working class. Half the working class didn't have, the, the male working class didn't have the vote. That's even before we think about the suffragettes fighting for the right to vote yeah, at yeah. that time. Their enemy is the yeah, government. Yeah. Their enemy is a ruling class that won't give people the right to participate in the political process. What if you're living under British imperial rule? What's the view from below then? If you're an Irish nationalist, or you're an Egyptian nationalist, or you're an Indian nationalist, the enemy is the British Empire. The enemy is the British Army. The enemy is the British policeman. If you look at it from below, the war looks very, very different. One of the things they tell us is that when we lefties like us, when we talk about the First World War in, in, in this way, what we're doing is we are dishonouring the memory of those who fought in the First World War. Well, we've heard one story, um, one, one, one family story already. Let me share another one with you. And we've all got these stories. My granddad fought in the uh, First World War. He got uh, shot down, body filled with shrapnel uh, in High Wood, High Wood on the, on the Somme. And until the day he died, he died in the 1960s, until the day he died, he believed that he was fighting a just war. That was his view. There were many other soldiers who didn't have that view, but I have to say, my view is that my granddad was wrong and that the other soldiers who took a different view were right because the war was contested. It's not true that everyone thought that what they were doing was the right thing. There were huge anti-war demonstrations across Europe 
in June and July of 1914. Huge anti-war demonstrations. Large numbers of men who were conscripted were conscripted into a war they didn't agree with. When Harry Patch, the last British Tommy, who died back in 2009, when Harry Patch got conscripted, they had to conscript Harry Patch because he didn't believe in the war and didn't want to go. So they, cons but they conscripted him in 1917. He was part of a Lewis gun, a light machine gun team. There were five of them. And those five guys agreed they would never shoot a German. Well, never shoot to kill. Interesting, interesting parallel with the, with, is it Phil? Yes. Phil's story. Um, they made a pact. And Harry Patch in his autobiography actually tells a story of a German soldier coming towards him and him having to make that split second decision. And he fired and hit him in the leg. Deliberately not killing him. The other thing Harry Patch says actually in his autobiography is very interesting is that he was involved in a mutiny. There was a kind of undercurrent of resistance running right the way through the war uh, in the trenches. There is a hidden history of pacifists, of conscientious objectors, of anti-war shop stewards, of anti-war socialists, of men in the trenches arguing about the war and making their own decision about whether or not they ought to be there. There is a, a, a class struggle about the nature of the war and whether the war should be happening that's running through the entire conflict. We need to recover that idea of the contested war because it was that struggle within the war that ended it. And this is the, the last idea that I want to share with you. Because when the German generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff went to the Kaiser and said we have to make peace. It was because the revolution had already started. The revolution had started with a revolt of the sailors on the high seas fleet in Kiel. It spread to the cities of Germany. It spread to Berlin and then it infected the trenches. And Hindenburg and Ludendorff knew that if they didn't make peace immediately, the German army would do exactly what the Russian army had done on the Eastern Front. The war on the Western Front an imperialist slaughter whose purpose was to make people who were already fantastically rich even richer. That slaughter that cost 15 million lives was ended by the mass action of ordinary soldiers, sailors, workers, peasants and poor people across Europe in the biggest revolt against war and the biggest revolt against the system that had created it in human history so far. That's the key lesson that we should be putting in our campaigning over the next four years. That's the argument that we should be projecting in response to those who want to promote a message in the context of this centenary that what happened between 1914 and 18 was a necessary <coughs> war and by implication that other wars that might be fought in the future that would tear societies apart in the same way are justified. Mm -hmm.